Hi traders, welcome to this edition of Expert Market Analysis brought to you by Arante. This is generally a bi-weekly review and preview, so every other week, of the market's key events and trading opportunities. Well, so I just let you have a quick look at the disclaimer. I'll just run through some of the key objectives of this webinar. We think markets are generally driven by themes which buyers and sellers relate to in order to enter and exit markets. These stories or narratives can be long-term fundamentals or short-term themes that increase or decrease in importance over time. So uh, this week, I'll just run through what we hope to get through in the next 30, 40 minutes or so. We'll just have a brief uh, rundown of what's happening uh, in markets, uh, what has been happening actually over the last couple of days this week. We'll then get into um, stocks and just see how U.S. equities are performing, uh, whilst also looking at some of the technicals in the S&P, in the Dow and in the Nasdaq 100. We'll then uh, briefly review uh, those big central bank meetings from last week. So the Fed, we'll look at the DXY, that's the dollar index. We'll look at the ECB and euro dollar, and we'll look at um, the Bank of Japan meeting as well last Friday, uh, as well as dollar yen, which is getting up to some interesting levels uh, as well. Uh, we'll then uh, certainly um, have a look at what's going on this week. Uh, we'll tie in that sort of Fed review with... Um, Chair Powell's testimony today in a few hours in front of Congress. Uh, and then we'll certainly as well uh, very quickly review the UK CPI data before then looking at the Bank of England meeting tomorrow. Huge, uh, huge, very strong, ugly report uh, from the UK this morning um, with the inflation data much stronger than expected and core hitting multi-decade highs. So uh, we'll look at that in depth. Uh, after a quick review of those big events previously. Okay, first of all, we'll go to um, uh, how markets are shaping up currently, of course. And just bear with me, I'll just pull up the S&P 500 chart. Uh, this week, at least anyway, we're braced for around, I think it's around 10 central bank policy decisions across the developed and emerging market space. Uh, as well, of course, as I said, Powell's congressional testimony uh, in a few hours' time. Uh, it's interesting, last week's hawkish pushback, really, from the ECP and what should be a series of at least 25 basis point rate hikes in the UK, possibly 50. We'll talk about that shortly. Norway as well and Switzerland, 25 basis point hikes nailed on there, all on Thursday, all tomorrow, uh, really serving as a reminder that the Fed is not hiking in isolation. Uh, just after that then, it was a three-day weekend in the US, uh, had a holiday on Monday, so volumes were muted really across Monday, across markets. Um, Asia markets slightly lower, Japan recently high-flying shares sort of moved down, uh, found a little bit of a bid uh, today, but there was or has been some disappointment over that Chinese economic stimulus not explicitly helping uh, the real estate sector there. Uh, and we also had actually a, ser a series of investment bank GDP forecast downgrades for China uh, to kick off the week. Uh, we then had those productive, relatively positive productive talks from President Xi and Blinken, uh, though no real big breakthroughs aside from agreeing to schedule a reciprocal visit. Uh, yesterday, slightly downbeat session in US equities um, with Chinese stocks slumping overnight. Um, although, uh, as I said, Japan managed to avoid that weak sentiment, sort of putting uh, better gains. A gold putting up major supports now, despite a slump uh, in Treasury yields yesterday. Um, 1933 currently gold prices, the low from last week, 1925, before we had buyers step in, uh, yields went lower as the dollar went lower as well. So 1925, a key level really for gold uh, and whether we then push back or, or stay in the current range with the top side around 1984, I think. Um, just on equities, then you can see uh, this S&P chart. Um, they, as I said, headed lower yesterday, extending the kind of risk off sentiment that started in China over that smaller property rate cut than expected, really. 
uh, below the surface of declines, there was a pocket of strong gains consisting of, you guessed it, IT stocks, tech stocks, um, Tesla up over 5%, PayPal nearly 4% higher, and video uh, 2.6% higher, Salesforce 2.5% higher. So really highlighting, again, uh, the kind of slightly speculative fever, which is still intact in selected technology stocks. Um, the stronger than expected, we did get stronger than expected US uh, May housing starts and building projects that kind of helped home builders. Um, so generally for stocks then, uh, well, last week they recorded actually their biggest weekly gain since March as really investors hoped that the Fed's aggressive campaign of invest, uh, interest rate rises would soon end. Um, the S&P ended, well, Friday ended lower, um, oscillating between gains and losses, but was actually up 2.6% over the previous five sessions, so last week, and that was his biggest monthly gain, sorry, weekly gain, sorry, since late March. Um, the benchmark, actually, you can see here, so that's the biggest um, our weekly gain after um, a decent consecutive uh, run of um, green candles, so positive sessions on the week. Uh, on the daily as well, uh, we had six consecutive sessions, rising sessions by Thursday's close, actually. Uh, so that was its longest winning streak since November 2021. Um, both indices, so that S&P, the benchmark, the broad chip, uh, blue chip, sorry, and the NASDAQ composite, uh, as well as the NASDAQ 100, actually, um, um, up on the year, of course, uh, on hopes that uh, we get an end, of course, to the Fed's historic policy uh, to raise rates to tame inflation. That's pushed both indices into bull market territory, so up over 20% from the October lows. Um, also, of course, that incorporates that resolution uh, after a weeks-long political standoff over the debt ceiling. And then we've had this decent rally um, over the course of the last few weeks, for sure. Uh, if we just look at the S&P, then technically, um, we've highlighted, of course, this um, break to the upside above 4,200. Everybody is looking at 4,200 as the key level. You can see that gray line is 100-week moving average. Uh, and then you had the top from the end of January at 4195. So sort of solidifying that area, which you can see we were trying to push up above for a few weeks beforehand. Uh, we finished uh, after dipping uh, lower towards the end of May at 4100. We got to nearly, but then closed strongly. And then that was uh, the, the precursor, if you like, to this bullish break higher. Uh, we put above then the mid-August high as well, which is at 43.25. So that should act as some uh, support, as well as then this FIB level of the decline from sort of last year, 43.11, that major FIB level. So that should offer some support, 43.11, 43.25. Uh, and then potentially next, uh, next sort of upside level, is well the minor fib level really at 45.34 probably uh, if we do get higher we're we're getting towards overbought territory but not too much doesn't mean we can't go higher as you can see previously like sort of uh, a couple of summers ago uh, so 43 uh, sorry 45.34 upside level and then sort of 43.11 43.25 support level on um, the S and P and you can see these consecutive days of gains and then pushing up. Uh, towards those highs now above where, well, the high was 44.48. Um, and when we just come off that, uh, as I say, support just above 4,300 in the S&P. For the NASDAQ, similarly strong gains, uh, again, above sort of the previous, uh, well, mid-August high, actually, 13.720, strong push higher, push above that FIB level at 14.349. So that should offer some support, and you can see it did uh, over the previous couple of weeks. Uh, and then we've got that uh, top side fib, minor fib level at 15,411 to aim for for the bulls. Uh, and if we look at the daily, you can see, well, upside breakout level above that sort of 14,3 level is probably around 14,670 or so. Uh, that's in the NASDAQ 100. I think, interestingly, we should put out the Dow.
show as well because we've pointed out previously the um the big resistance level around 34281 you can see it there uh, that goes back to mid august last year capping the upside numerous occasions and then even last week we did close above it on the week 34299 uh the level 34288 are just around it and then we've just moved back into below it now uh, after putting that high last Friday at 34.588. So uh, interesting level whether we can decisively break above it, 34.281 or not. Uh, and then we'd come back towards, say, um, where are we? Sort of, uh, yeah, bottom of this recent range around 33.811 or so. So that's the Dow and uh, stock indices in the US. Okay, let's move to quickly to US CPI data first of all um, that was out uh, last week of course uh, of course uh, generally for May broadly in line with expectations you can see uh, the falling headline there in the orange um, that moved down to four uh, percent so just below the 4.1 expected month on month one percent expected that was uh, yeah the consensus call um, and that comes down from 4.9% previously, actually the slowest rate of headline inflation since March 2021. And then the core CPI, uh, that rose 0.4% month on month, so still strong, uh, but 5.3% uh, was um, the figure in the end. So still sticky, you can see on this chart, although falling. Here's a graphic just of those numbers that I've just reiterated. 0.4, probably the big one, still sticky. Uh, that's been the last print really for the past eight, uh, sorry, six times uh, you can see there. Um, of course, that yearly figure is down from five and a half percent. So actually the slowest annual rate of core inflation since November 2021. So kind of all in all, um, neutral to dovish report really, despite that annual probably core inflation touch higher than some consensus. But uh, the details in 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 uh, going behind under the bonnet, if you like, was to the soft side, really, this super poor CPI. So that's X shelter and healthcare was up only 2%. So confirming the moderation that started in April. Uh, and then we also had um, used car prices that pulled up the core, but likely to be temporary as wholesale prices are moving lower again in the past few months. So uh, interesting for US CPI then. Uh, and then if we look at, well, uh, we've just got a chart here just showing what we put out over the last few months, last few weeks, especially just how uh, goods inflation is subsiding. Uh, uh, but then shelter is now driving the headline. But that is meant to have peaked with uh, rents prices coming down in some of the surveys. So uh, interesting to watch that is uh, to see if inflation falls uh, more quickly or quickly uh, or stays sticky at elevated levels still. Okay, just moving on to then the um, the Fed, of course. Uh, we'll just go to the CME Fed watch tool, first of all. Uh, this obviously is, we've used this a lot before for any of you guys who um, who aren't aware of it. Uh, it's um, basically Fed funds futures for the specific dates of the Fed meetings. So the next one, 26th of July, then the 20th of September, start of November and then mid-December. Four meetings left this year uh, and this part is where markets think rates will be. So really interesting and really uh, a driver for of course, markets for the dollar, especially. Uh, so the Fed, just recapping, they skipped that rate rise as expected, left, left rates unchanged at five to five and a quarter percent. Um, it, but of course, the, uh, it updated or we had updated dot plots, which signaled that there may be two more rate hikes to come this year, with the first one most likely in July. Um, it ramped up its uh, 2023 rate dot forecast 50 basis points then to 5.6% from 5.1% previously in March. Um, with 12 of the uh, 18 uh, officials pushed for the higher peak rate at 5.5 to 5.75%, so midpoint 5.6 or so. Um, um, 
Interesting then, uh, growth and core inflation uh, numbers were revised higher for this year, 1% from 0.4% in March, 3.9% from 3.6% previously, and respectively, uh, and remain more or less unchanged further out. Basically, ongoing labor market strength has forced the Fed to lower the expected unemployment rate as well to just 4.1% by the end of this year from 4.5% and then 4.5% in two years' time. Uh, and interestingly, actually, a lack of evidence of credit contraction following the bank crisis was cited as a driver for upgrading the projected economic performance. Uh, we had talked about that previously in uh, other webinars, how um, – uh, the contraction in credit um, conditions, in lending conditions, and potentially more regulation after the banking crisis may affect the economy, economic activity, and slow uh, force a slowdown. Interesting at the moment, lack of evidence of that but, uh, seen by the Fed, but uh, something to bear in mind, we think, going forward as well. Uh, you kind of think then, why go for a pause and not just a hike, um, just hike rates? Um, certainly, the Fed wishes to go slowly and more gradually after its aggressive tightening campaign. Remember, the most aggressive in over 40 years. Um, and it's also probably the best chance for cooling the economy rather than bringing on a recession. So remember about the talk of a hard landing, soft landing, and even uh, just this very gentle landing that the Fed is aiming for. Of course, the idea with rate hikes is obviously to slow the economy, dampen down um, activity and demand. But obviously, there's this fine line that the Fed is trying to um, thread, if you like, that needle. Uh, so not uh, forcing any sort of worse slowdown recession and breaking the economy. Uh, certainly then going easy also implies rates potentially need to be high for a long enough period, as I say, to dampen activity sufficiently, but more importantly, to bring inflation back to target. Um, the Fed then sees next year's policy at four and a half to four and three quarter percent, and then three and a quarter to three and a half percent in 2025. That's from 3.1 percent. So overall, reducing the scope for rate cuts that may be seen following this tightening cycle. That was all in the dot plots. Uh, again, kind of slightly a meeting of two halves, really, because then in Powell's press conference, he suggested that the Fed's approach would very much remain data dependent, um, which may not leave much room to hike further. He stressed that the dot plot was not a plan or a decision and that the Fed will continue to make decisions on a meeting by meeting basis. Um, he did see the labor market in better balance, albeit still tight, um, but bringing inflation to target will need below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Um, he then sort of said the July meeting is live uh, and of course uh, the bank will be certainly definitely data dependent. Um, that is probably key for, uh, or quite a nice um, lead into obviously what uh, what we may hear from the um, Fed Chair Powell later today at his congressional um, testimony. It's essentially the release of the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. There are hopes that he will provide slightly more clarity on that sort of um, muffled uh, sort of two-time, two um, two -time, two way um, uh, sort of policy direction that he gave on Wednesday at, um, well, with the dot box um, stating or being slightly more hawkish, but then him backing slightly away from that in the press conference. So more clarity, hope for buy markets, certainly. Um, but then we have to think, unless there's that substantial drop in inflation or um, certainly a material slowing in job creation, uh, then a July rate hike is likely. And um, you can see on the CME Fed watch tool then for July, 77% chance of uh, uh, a 25 basis point hike. But interestingly then, if we go to September, if we do get that hike, then uh, there's more chance of a cut than another hike. You can see 19% that we, if we hike in July by 25 to five and a quarter to five and a half, then uh, more chance that we then dip back to five to five and a quarter than this other hike 
that um, the Fed are projecting in their dot plots. And again, even in November, uh, more chance that we get that cut and not that other hike. Okay, uh, then by December, just to put you in the picture. So by year end again, uh, 33, 1 in 3% chance really that we get a rate cut by the end of December from the presumed hike in July. Um, and you can see uh, if we look at previous um, uh, probabilities, you can see that, uh, well, interestingly, that, uh, yeah, 50% chance, coin toss chance, we stay uh, at five and a quarter to five and a half uh, once, or if we hike their next meeting in July, um, there was 0% chance of that happening a month ago because rate cuts were priced in. You can see a 44% chance that rates would be at four and a half to four and three quarter percent. That was just a month ago. So um, we think for Chair Powell today, um, uh, while he, he didn't really uh, accentuate the dot plot, he did um, push back against the idea of rate cuts. He said they're not near at all at the moment and um, would be some time away. Uh, so it'll be interesting whether he just reiterates that, that, um, that direction again and pushes back against um, the uh, um, idea of any rate cuts anytime soon. Uh, then, I, I guess, looking forward, the first week of July is when we get an important set of data, of course, with non-farm payrolls, for sure, um, coming out at the start of July. So, really, whether that continues with the theme of quite solid job gains or not. Uh, and then we get US CPI data on the 12th of July, uh, the following week. Okay, uh, we sort of mentioned, um, yeah, Chair Powell's. Um, congressional testimony, not a lot of other data this week um, out of the US. We will have initial jobless claims, which have been higher than expected, really around the 260K mark. So anything around that, again, uh, will give the impression that um, these job cuts, which have obviously been announced uh, across uh, the economy, really, the US, uh, potentially they're feeding in then to initial jobless claims. And then Possibly then that will hit the non-farm payrolls report at the start of July. Okay, let's go to now, um, well, we'll go quickly to uh, the DXY chart, uh, which just shows you sort of leading really to um, euro dollar and the ECB, because uh, certainly uh, if you remember Euro has around a 56, 57% weighting in the DXY. Uh, um, uh, that's with uh, six uh, other currencies. Well, six currencies in total. Uh, Euro has a, by far the strongest weighting. So essentially, if you reverse this chart, then you'd get Euro dollar. But for the DXY anyway, you can see we rolled over after sort of printing 104.69, uh, just moving lower then. Um, on uh, the Fed, first of all, and then the ECB on the Thursday, you can see there, uh, dip below the 50-day moving average, that's that blue line. Uh, we're just sort of tracking below it slightly now. 102.63 may offer some uh, resistance. Uh, and then the grey line there is the 100-day moving average, 103.06 or so. So that's the DXY. If we go to uh, Euro dollar then, uh, and the ECB, uh, kind of, uh, yes, uh, they did as expected as well, um, adding to their most aggressive tightening cycle on record, actually one month ahead of the first anniversary of when they kicked this off. Uh, they hiked by 25 basis points, deposit rate now at 3.5%. Just remember a year ago it stood at negative 0.5%. Uh, and the base case scenario really put to another nailed on 25 basis point move in July. Um, interestingly, then, uh, for the ECB, despite a recent softening in actual headline and core inflation, it still remains too high. Expectations for inflation to return to target only in two years from now. So there were clear arguments for the ECB to continue raising rates. Um, the fact that the ECB's newest staff projections included an upward revision of both headline and core inflation across the entire high 
time horizon so 5.1 percent in core this year certainly then must have strengthened the case for continued hiking uh so essentially yeah we got new projections which um pointed to headline and core inflation higher uh, even in 2025 uh, above the target rate for the ecb um Lagarde certainly painted that picture as well. Inflation has been coming down, but is projected to remain too high for too long. Uh, and the markets then picked up on Lagarde's pretty hawkish message, really. Uh, the front end of the German uh, yield curve, the bond market, really, um, that sold off uh, 11 basis points or so. Uh, so yields went higher uh, and the 10 year yield as well finished some five basis points higher as well. Um, the kind of moves were uh, sort of restricted slightly because we had a mixed bag of U.S. Um, data, as I said, about those U.S. Um, initial jobless claims at 260, second straight reading. Um, but generally, uh, things weighed on the dollar and we saw euro dollar strength. And you can see there a uh, big green candle on Thursday, uh, euro dollar surge from sort of 108. 108.03 actually the low to that high at 109.52 and closed just slightly off there at 109.45 so very strong day for the euro against the dollar um and in fact the euro generally it skyrocketed towards a 15-year high in euro yen for example 153.55 that high uh let's just check where we are now um euro yen uh we're just off that now you can see well sorry we're above that now we're just um sort of uh consolidating around those near those highs actually the high came on friday 155.26 in the end actually in euro yen so that looks bullish like bullish consolidation uh before another push higher if we can move above well where are we 155.32 is the high now uh but back to euro dollar then um and the ecb especially uh, well, since the meeting, we obviously do get a lot of sort of fine tuning by ECB officials come out on the wires. Um, they've highlighted the risk of really um, the ECB policy cycle extending beyond July after that 25 basis point hike. That's pretty much na nailed on now. And I think markets now pricing in sort of 4% now is the peak terminal rate. So another 25 basis points through the summer expected by markets. Uh, of course, we've had the hawks come out echoing um, sort of sentiments, recent sentiments that there is more ground to cover and the ECB may need to keep raising rates after the summer even. Um, markets kind of weren't entirely convinced with that. Um, but now, as I say, sort of they pushed September uh, futures rates towards that 4% level. Um, we do get continued ECB speakers on the wires, I think, this week. So watch out for those. Um, but a lot of, uh, of the driving in euro dollar, of course, will be done by um, Chair Powell later uh, and what he covers. Um, I think interesting going forward then, Europe, um, there is a potential slowing in the economy. We've seen some of that resilience kind of potentially under threat. Uh, but that's obviously you have to contrast that with the US potentially um, and whether that boys euro sentiment uh, whether that continues or not. Uh, Euro dollar then, you can see uh, that sort of um, rounded low, if you like, which we developed sort of through um, end of end of May, um, through June, and then this sharp uh, uh, move higher, quite dynamic gains really, which is a bullish sign really after this um, rounded low, if you like. Support around then initially, potentially that 50-day moving average, 108.77, um, uh, and then sort of 100-day moving average around 108, 108.05. Uh, and then the top, near-term top, potentially if we can hold around here, is kind of a flag, a bullish flag potentially, but we need to break 109.70 then to have a look at 10, uh, well, sorry, 110.32, which is this thick dotted line there, which is the previous high, um, the uh, early February high, which sort of capped the upside you can see um, through sort of April and May um, a few months ago. 
Uh, this week then in uh, Europe, we do get on Friday um, PMI data, all, all important for the Eurozone always. Um, we'll get a taste of seeing how the month of June is shaping up in terms of economic activity. Um, last month actually brought pretty bleak report on the economy. PMI indicated that services experienced slower growth, manufacturing still um, still in the doldrums, still below 50 and experienced quite a sharp contraction. Uh, the upside actually, though, was around fading inflation expectations, so something to bear in mind. Uh, but there is kind of little indication that activity has picked up from there. Uh, but we get that data early on Friday morning out of the Eurozone. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, OK, just uh, moving on then to uh, the other major central bank meeting from last week, the Bank of Japan, of course. Kind of produced few fireworks as expected. They left all policy measures unchanged. Uh, it had been tempting to speculate that some tightening or tweaking was warranted as economic growth turned positive in the first quarter. Inflation, of course, is near its highest levels in three decades. And the outlook for wage growth had brightened after the results of the spring wage negotiations. Sadly, the Bank of Japan uh, is still pushing back against policy normalization. Uh, it's kind of doubtful, it thinks, that uh, these victories on the wage front will persist. Uh, and the bank really expects inflation to decelerate towards the middle of uh, this fiscal year 2023. Um, they also see risk to the outlook um, as still high with a global slowdown. Um, still a concern for the bank uh, and special attention needed to um, to developments in financial and FX markets. Uh, it's kind of a game of patience, really, uh, for the Bank of Japan. They want to see credible evidence that inflation will remain substantially above 2% before then it thinks about phasing out. It's obviously massive stimulus. Um, the next meeting is the end of July, 28th of July, I think. Um, so that would certainly give policymakers um, access to new economic forecasts that it will publish then. Um, um, and then also, uh, well, potentially we see an upgrade in its inflation forecasts in that quarterly report, which is released at the end of July. Uh, so that could potentially justify uh, policy action by the Bank of Japan. Um, uh, we expect i think inflation is expected to remain higher for longer as well in japan so that will be something certainly to look out for um also then the overall the sort of market functions have improved although there have been some fluctuations since of course that december band widening in the yield curve control policy uh but certainly the market has not been testing the sort of upper limit of that band so stresses have been reduced uh, and then that means it could be uh, an opportune moment for um, the BOJ to revi revisit its policy bands again. Uh, also, uh, we have to remember a weaker yen likely adds more inflationary pressures, um, and that then uh, means the bank could potentially be behind the curve, uh, which um, which with the economy sort of recovering solidly compared to other major com economies, uh, then if that outperforms, then that, of course, is something to bear in mind in two. Uh, also then by that 28th of July uh, meeting of the Bank of Japan, the Fed will have met, will have decided on monetary policy and then uh, the direction really for U.S. Treasuries will be a factor for the uh, bank to consider. So dollar yen, um, interesting levels, as I said, we're getting up to, we sort of track sideways around 140, you can see there. Uh, let me just pull it back slightly. Uh, daily chart's probably better. Track sideways around 140, then a break higher uh, last Thursday, uh, and then certainly on Friday uh, last week. Uh, pushed up ab above sort of that high uh, around 141 and we sort of touched where are we a high at 142.25. Um, lots of noise around now intervention levels. We've had a couple of verbal interventions already, uh, although that is tallied with, uh, I think overnight we had a BOJ official being quite dovish as well. Um, but intervention levels, interestingly, uh, last year they started um, in September around 145. That was, if you remember, the first time since 1998. Um, then we had second and third interventions again around 140. 
165 and then 150 uh, in October uh, 21st and 24th, I think, when we pushed above 150. Um, so kind of think those could be lines in the sand for the Japanese government for more intervention. We're not there yet, uh, but let's just pull back and you can see, yeah, these levels here sort of September 140, yeah. Uh, well, intervention came at 145 and then 150, where we then poked up to 151.94 was the high. So um, interesting, yeah, lots of noise around that. Also, I think um, the nominal effective exchange rate, so that compares then the yen, not just against the dollar, but against the euro, against sterling, uh, those have uh, that rate has revisited levels that we saw in September last year. So tallies with a sort of 145 level as a level of intervention. So just watch out for that. Uh, if we do move higher, if we do stay above probably this level, 141, I'd say, uh, then this is bullish consolidation before another move higher, uh, potentially, possibly on the back of a, a, um, a more hawkish Powell say, then we push up uh, through the high, through 142.25 up towards 145 and possible intervention levels uh, there. So that's the Bank of Japan. OK, let's get to um, now the UK, all important UK. Certainly we had, um, uh, bear with me one second. We had uh cpi data of course out today uh just recapping we had that strong jobs data out last week as well last wednesday uh unexpected fall in the jobless rate to 3.8 percent uh so very close to the all-time lows kind of underscores the overall resilience of the labor market uh then we had that wage growth data which was strong um i think 7.2 percent the annual rate of growth um so very strong still, uh, and it's clear that, um, well, wage growth f is failing really to fall back either. Um, so so it may have peaked, but the slow uh, down will um, be slower than expected, um, kind of due to labour market shortages, uh, which are uh, being given as sort of partly structural. So um, that kind of rules out rate cuts um, being unlikely for at least a year. Um, then the inflation data, as I say, that printed very strongly, 8.7% uh, in the headline versus expectations for 8.4. Uh, and previously it was 8.4, so we've revisen, uh, sorry, revi we've gone higher by three tenths. And then the core as well, 7.1%, so uh, a multi-decade high in that, expected at 6.8% and was 6.8% previously as well. Um, so really disturbing, ugly data for the Bank of England to get their heads around. Um, it's actually the fourth successive upside surprise in both the headline and the core rates. Um, um, and as I said, the core is the highest now it's been in 31 years. Um, Interesting, yeah, going forward, well, on the chart, you can see that CPI leveling off 8.7%, that headline rate, and then the core still going higher. And really, uh, a lot of economists pointing out uh, the importance of services inflation now driving the numbers. Um, that gets focus from the Bank of England because it tends to exhibit more persistent and less volatile trends. So a lot of focus on services inflation, whereas, say, core goods inflation, that is expected to come down sharply soon. So it's all about services um, and that persistence in those less volatile trends. Uh, and you can see it there, still going higher, which is certainly not what the Bank of England want to see. Um, if we just move on then to the Bank of England, um, just got the main numbers here, that 8.7% headline reading. Then you've got that 6.8% actually wage growth number, sorry, uh, but a big jump from the 6.1% and then that push high, uh, lower in the jobless rate as well. So a tight, hot labour market, hot inflation numbers. And really the only course of action is, of course, from the Bank of England, uh, nailed on 25 basis point hike. I think there's, well, depends what you look at, around... Probably it was a coin toss chance, 50-50 of even a 50 basis point move now from Bank of England uh, tomorrow. I think that's lessened slightly, sort of 40% or so. 
uh, just looking at pricing. Um, uh, but still, a material chance over 50 basis point move. I know um, uh, it's interesting that would be out of character for the Bank of England, certainly. Um, um, and there's been no hints of a 50 basis point move by any of the commentary we've seen recently. Um, also, um, also um, the um, 50 basis point move would. Um, yeah, sorry, would, uh, well, the chances are of that, sorry, just bear with me, I'm just trying to put some pricing here, but um, the chances of a 50 basis point move are, um, well, slightly less, well, they were much less uh, before, obviously, the CPI data, but there's kind of a high hurdle to the Bank of England moving in those increments of 50 basis points because, uh, as I said, yeah, no hints by the um, uh, officials yet. We also get no press conference and no um, new protections from the bank. So um, they really like to move, uh, they or would normally like to move in bigger increments uh, when they can then explain it and they have the forecast to back it up. We don't have any of that at this meeting tomorrow. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, certainly, then, a hawkish hike. Of 25 is expected. Certainly, um, um, attention will be on any guidance provided by the bank. As it stands, existing guidance notes that if there were to be evidence of more persistent, uh, basically pressures, then further tightening would be required. Uh, market pricing, then, you can see uh, at least sort of another 125 basis points uh, of tightening expected. That's sort of six. 25 basis point hikes. I think there's around 90 basis points for the next three meetings. So that implies uh, for the next, sorry, through the summer. So that implies at least 150 basis point hike as, much, as far as markets are concerned. Uh, interestingly, though, I think analysts, economists in the city suggesting that um, this um, tightening uh, 125 basis point is too aggressive. Um, because, uh, and I think the base case is around 50 basis points of further hikes uh, judged to be, yeah, the base case, as I say, simply as the implication of a very hawkish uh, Bank of England policy stance would be or could be uh, a very quick recession next year. Uh, much then um, depends on going forward then CPI inflation data in the next couple of months. Uh, reality really is that UK rates are, are comfortably into restrictive territory already. Um, so that additional tightening, um, that's why it looks potentially excessive. Uh, the uh, more restrictive we go, of course, then the more impact that will have potentially on uh, the economy going forward. Uh, and certainly as well, the uh, Bank of England officials have cited the um, potential, the lagged effects of all of this tightening that has already been to the economy, uh, and they're waiting for that to feed into um, uh, households, into businesses. Uh, and of course, there is this concern around mortgage rates now, uh, hundreds of thousands of households on fixed rates, two year and five year fixed rates, which, um, although uh, more people own a house from, um, say, 2008. Uh, there are more people coming off these uh, fixed rate mortgages in the next few months, which then um, sees their bills increase by hundreds of pounds a month going forward. Um, as far as, um, yeah, you can see just this chart here, probably needed to update it now as we go higher in the potential for uh, market impact path of rate hikes. Uh, I just think if we look at quickly, if we look at um, uh, cable, finally, just bear with me while I bring that up, which is here. You can see cable dropping actually now. It's a really interesting uh, sort of reaction, really, from, uh, well, the immediate impact after the uh, upside surprise in inflation. Um, sterling initially jumped, actually, but then we've uh, rapidly, you can see, rapidly arranged any gains. Uh, and that's probably signals how the room for a ha further hawkish repricing in the sterling curve is limited. Uh, and so as well are the positive implications for sterling for more 
uh, of more data surprises. So uh, interesting move, um, certainly as well. There's um, noises around stagflation. So that's where we have slower growth uh, and higher inflation, which is really a toxic mix for the economy potentially um, if these, uh, if the Bank of England carries on, um, well, hiking especially, but then can't hike because we have high inflation, so it needs to keep rates higher for longer, uh, and that hits uh, the economy going forward. Uh, as cable then, you can see we've got the thick dotted line in there, 126.79, that was the mid-May high, uh, so that should potentially offer some support to cable, in the near term, uh, moving averages quite far away, uh, down at sort of 125, then the next level uh, for cable. Otherwise, um, well, looks like we're rolling over, but the high, 40-month uh, high, that was at 128.48 in sterling against the dollar. Lots to look forward to in cable then, um, uh, as we look towards the yeah, Bank of England meeting tomorrow. Okay. Um, that's all we have time for. Hopefully uh, you've enjoyed that and you've taken something from it. No questions, as I see. Um, good luck out there and we'll speak to you uh, next week.